This today is a tale of two men. I preached this message one time, and I titled it that. But today I want to emphasize with the titling change, and that is a warning to the hard-hearted. There's nothing worse than a hard heart. Have you ever dealt with somebody that's just hard-hearted? Yeah. Versus somebody that has a empathetical, a compassionate, soft heart. Understandable. Versus the hard, bitter heart. We're going to look at the tale of two men today. One that was broken before Christ and humbly leaning into the bosom of God, and one that was self-sufficient in his own mind. Perhaps selfish, self-centered. Many people live in a me-centric world. I remember it was Galileo that was excommunicated from the church in his day. Because through deep study in one time, he had to present to the church his convictions that undoubtedly God had showed him. And that was the fact that in a world that thought the solar system revolved around the earth, he had to deliver to them the fact that the solar system, including the earth, revolved around the sun. And thus he was rejected by many people, a lot of scholars, a lot of ignorant believers and scholars, and eventually, from what I understand in reading, was excommunicated or vigorously attempted to be excommunicated from the church of that day because of the truth. Folks, I want you to understand that just because we look at things a certain way doesn't make them right, okay? There, as I've said, oftentimes we may look at a collar and it appear blue to one and green to another, but in the middle stands the objective truths and this one here, this objective truth, and objective truth, by the way, as I've mentioned recently, is something that personal opinion does not change. The Word of God is nothing but a massive objective truth for humanity. And the truth of the matter is, was in your power verse earlier. It is appointed unto man, everybody is going to die. And after this, you will stand before God. Make no mistake about it. Well, what about the believer? What about the Christian that is saved? It's called the judgment seat of Christ. Some will call it the Bema Seat Rewards, where the Christian stands before the Lord, but praise be unto God, Jesus is the mighty counselor between you and God. And even in your failures, Jesus says, they're under my blood. But for the unsaved, they will not stand through that judgment. They die and immediately go to a place called hell. Hell is a place in the scriptures that is described in many places as Gehenna, a place of torment, a place that where the Bible describes in common terminology, the worm will never die. That means the body is never consumed, but at the same time, the pain is never quenched. And they will be in that holding place from the time they die all the way through the remaining timeline of the history of man's redemption at work, that meaning through the church age, through the rapturing of the church, through the entire seven-year tribulation, through the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ, and at the end of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ, there will be the judgment, or excuse me, the great white throne judgment. That is the judgment where sinners stand before God. Jesus is nowhere in the picture to be your go-between, your advocate, or your great and mighty counselor. But you will stand naked spiritually before God as God reviews in the books everything in your life. And it was very displeasing to God, and he will punctuate the fact that your life never once received the blood of his Son upon your sin. Therefore, not because of what you did, but more so what you never did do, and that was receive the blood of Christ. God never sent anybody to hell because they was an unbeliever merely, but he sent them to hell because they allowed for sin to reign in their mortal body. He never got to give you a new name, so thus in the end he will say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you, and you will be associated with sin, death, and hell, and because that hell was designed for the devil and his angels and like a vortex and a cinder block tied the ankle sucking everything that is evil and contrary to God with it the sinner will be guilty by association and you will send yourself to hell because you never made things in reconciliation with God and that is it in a nutshell now going back to what we said about in hell you imagine being in a place that is waiting a place even worse 
Because the Bible says that hell will be cast into the lake of fire, a bottomless pit, a place where you just literally are tormented for all eternity. Not because God wanted the sinner to go there. As I had said, restate, it was designed for the devil and his angels. And it will be the incineration of all evil that will be cast away from God. I believe when that day comes, like a science fiction movie, it'll just go... And it'll just seal over. And nothing but the gloriousness of God will remain. And the Bible says that a new heaven and a new earth will remain or be created of God's presence and the eradication of all evil. And at that time, the new city Jerusalem will come down out of heaven adorned like a bride for her wedding and light up on earth and God will be on his throne. And in that city, there will be no need for light, but God will be the illuminating factor out of that city. And the river of life will flow from the throne of God and we'll go right on down into the lushness of a new heaven and a new earth. Don't that sound better than hell today, people? Come so on! Don't that sound better than being separated from God and everything good? Yeah. Don't that sound better than being completely cast away from everybody you love that went on before you? Think about it. Mm -hmm. yep. Great God in heaven. Amen. So we come to a tale of two men, one that went to heaven and one that went to hell. Look at this now as we pick up reading at verse 19 in Luke chapter 16. Boy, have, the, have there been enough hellfire and brimstone messages preached on this passage of Scripture down through the history of man's redemption. Look at verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of swords and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, look at this, and he was buried, and in hell he lift up his eye, being in torments, seeing Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. Let's stop for a minute and look at this. Each man had time and opportunity to believe and trust God, their creator, to obey the leading of the Lord. Bible said that God placed the world. In translation, it originally meant placed eternity in the heart of man. You cannot escape God. You cannot figure out God, so figure God into your life and understand that God's conviction is leading and reaching everybody in the world. Well, my goodness, the devil is reaching us, isn't he? Young people, the devil is pulling you in every which direction. He is fishing. He is looking. Christ and the disciples said that they are fishers of men. Well, let me tell you, Satan is a fisher of man's soul as well. And just like Christ reaching people with the wonderful and powerful word of God, so Satan has lowers in his tackle box. He may have something written on this one, something written on that one, something written on that one. You know, there's something about a lower. They're real pretty and eye-catching, aren't they? I'm not even a fisherman, but I go through the fishing section and I'm intrigued. I'm interested in these little gadgets. It's amazing. And you know what they're for? To attract fish. Why? To end their life. Amen. Oh, that's what Satan does. He has a lot of little gadgets in life. And they're attractive. And you know what they're for? To end our life. Now what you see is a tale of two men. One that gave up those fancy gadgets. And he leaned in to the will of God. Now it led him to poverty. We don't know the rest of the story as Paul Harvey used to say about this man. Or should I say the original story? But he may have given up a lot of opportunity this side of eternity to lean into the will of God on the other side of eternity. Whereas the rich man, and I want to stress, God does not have a problem with wealth and finances nowhere in the Bible. 
Does it say that money's the root of all evil? Money's needed in ministry and to help people's livelihood, pay their bills and give them a good living. There's nothing wrong with that. Nicodemus was rich. We know that. Zacchaeus was rich. We know that. Joseph of Arimathea that gave the tomb to Christ that was never used. Expensive tomb. More than likely a wealthy man. And we could go on. Joseph made wealthy by God down in Egypt against all odds. It's not the wealth. It is the getting lost in the wealth in our life. And this rich man, very contrary to the one that gave it up to lean into the bosom of God and into the will of God, we see one that was very taken by the, the allurements of this life and he allowed it to consume him. And he became completely lost within all the things on this side of eternity. And man, was he very lost. And the Bible says that this poor man that gave all things up here to invest in eternity, and by the way, investors, don't you want to invest in something that will bring back a good return? Why well, invest in life and it gives you nothing more than what you see here? So the beggar died. What does the Bible say happened to him? Now look at this. Let's, let's look at some scripture here. Verse, and it came to pass in verse 22 that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and just, it stops at buried, but it don't have a period. Buried, semicolon, continuation, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And he seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Some people have used the bosom of Abraham as a euphemism, as the presence and comfort of God. And others say, well, it was literally Abraham off in the distance. It does not matter. Either way <clears throat> is indicative of the presence of God. I don't, it doesn't matter to me who or how or where or whatever's going on. I want to be in the presence of God when I leave this life. And the Bible said for the believer absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. Another truth, objective truth in God's word. But let's look at the old rich man. Here he is. Imagine it for a moment, if you will. He passes on. When the rich man died, his body was buried. Probably had all the attention that one could have, money could afford. Wow. And although the rich man may have had a nice funeral and a lot of things in life, it's like this. He died and opened his eyes in hell and was in separation from everything and anything good. We come to another passage of Scripture in this as you read on. Verse 24 and the rich man, listen to this, after he sees Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham, you're picking up at verse 24 now in Luke chapter 16, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Man. Here's a guy that wouldn't allow Crumbs, crumbs. Probably didn't even pay attention to the crumbs that did fall off the table to the poor man. Now was begging, calling Abraham father, God the father, anybody, something, help me. Allow him to put his finger in the water. Just dropping, just a little drop, like an eye drop, just drop it on my tongue. My tongue <coughs> sizzling in my mouth. I'm tormented in this flame. Verse 25, Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. That's not made to sound vindictive or revengeful on God's part. That's made to state a very sober fact. If you choose your heaven here, you will have your hell later. You choose this world when the portion God gives you and lean into the will of God, you'll have your heaven later. It's that simple. And my God said that he'll give me a life more abundant now, living here for him. Praise God. You don't have to be a poor beggar. You don't have to be some fella in destitution. It's not about that. This is drawing a very strong picture for us to understand. 
The Bible says, set your affections on things above. It says in another place, don't become entangled with the things of this world. The rich man was entangled. Lazarus set his affections on things above. Demas was traveling in a ministry with Paul. He deserted Paul. And the scripture said in the words of Paul that Demas found the things of this world more attractive to him than the things of heaven and God. We never hear nothing more about Demas. I always thought it was strange because his name was Demas, like Demon, you know. <laughs> Whatever be the case, it's a picture that is drawn of God. Let me ask you a question. Where are you on this spectrum? Where are you staying? Do you know Jesus today as your personal Savior? Could somebody look at you and say, this person had Jesus in their heart? It's not about judgment. Come on, people. The Bible says you can tell a tree by the fruit it bears. Well, Preacher Calhoun used to say fruit inspectors is what we can be. Not about judging, but we see one another. Why do you think the Bible in one place says if you see your, uh, your brother in a weak state morally, help him out. We're going to see people's lives. My goal at this church, and has been for 20 years, to see people enriched by the Word, encouraged in the Lord, growing in Christ, but most of all, getting saved and knowing you belong to the Lord. And so we move on to the final verses of this situation, the tale of two men, and a warning for the hard-hearted. Look at verse 26. Now remember, in verse 25, Abraham had just said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime, and all of that stuff. Now look at verse 26. And beside all of this, oh, goodness, look at this. Beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf that is fixed, so that they which pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us and would come from thence. In other words, I can't come to you and you can't come to me. There is a gulf that is fixed after death. And you cannot transcend back and forth. There's no purgatory. That's a lie. There's no such thing of praying somebody out of the state, spiritually speaking, of which they died in. You die, the Bible says, in the direction the tree is leaning, thus it shall fall. And there it will remain. Today is a day of salvation. Today the just shall live by faith. Today Jesus is saying, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My goodness gracious, and we, we, we allow this gulf. Do you realize that gulf is racing toward us in time and space? Verse 27, bear with me, we're going to 31. I'm getting ready to close. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Now remember, Jesus is saying this. Jesus is soon going to be dead and he's going to rise from the dead and be seen of many and be known as the resurrected Savior. Thus, one from the dead came back to you. In the leading of the Holy Spirit to save your soul, people still not going to believe. Listen what Jesus says, these chilling words. Look at verse 27, I'll read them through. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, it's Jesus repeating words of the story. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Look at this. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. No, they wouldn't. People's lost all over the world today. Jesus came back. He resurrected. And still, people are just going to choose that great gulf. And he goes on and completes. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto him from the dead, they will repent. Look at verse 31. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Whew. Well, that's some wise words coming from Abraham that Jesus is reciting back. You know what he tells him? Oh, no. No, 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 no. <clears throat> There's where you're wrong. 
If they didn't hear this, if they didn't hear it and believe the Red Sea, if they didn't believe the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, if they didn't believe Daniel in the lion's den, if they didn't believe for everything that God delivered Israel out of, which is for our admonition, neither will they believe should one come from the dead and Jesus would be that one. He knew what he was talking about, didn't he? A warning for the hard-hearted. 